Yo guys and welcome back to another episode of Pod Ghost with myself Seth and your boy Yaz in the house. Come on. And we'd like to introduce onto the podcast today Kevin Lane. Thank you for having me lads. Pleasure to be here. Already I feel really comfortable. Great settings. No, Lovely thank place you, here for renting by the way. <laughs> <laughs> thank no, you so much. Thank Kevin. you very much for coming Kevin, you're right, Kevin, you're right with us calling you Kev, right? Yeah, you call me Catwalk Kev, Lights Out Lane. I like yeah, it. Oh, Kev, God. Lights Out Lane. <laughs> Like They're not my names, they were given to me from prison. Oh, is it, yeah? Uh, catwalk Kev, because I used to iron my clothes to go to the gym. <laughs> I changed my clothes twice a day in prison when I first went away for many years. And that came from me by uh, Kevin Baggett, a friend of mine, and Andy Russell. He flew an helicopter into Gartry and got Johnny Kendall out. And he wow. escaped out of Whitemore. Jeez. So, and then Lights Out Lane just come from people from prison. I like Catwalk Kev. Yeah, I like, like, like Walt Kev. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's what it's going to be named now. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to call it Catwalk Kev. You said Catwalk, I'll say Kev. That's it, yeah. So, Kev, you know what? Honestly, uh, pleasure of you know coming down. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Because you know it's, you're not local, man. It took you a while to get it, didn't it? Listen, you're talking <sighs> two and a half hours. Wow. Bloody it took hell. me an hour and 40 minutes to get here from Holland Park. And then, and then, and then, the time to get there to so two and a half bit hours, only three hours. No, we really honestly we really appreciate, appreciate that. that, man. That's all right. Because the good thing is, you know, I actually tried to get hold of Kev quite a while ago. Yeah. And for some reason, we couldn't, you know, get it done. And I was like, you know what? I don't think this is really, really going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Honestly. Course. And the fact you're here now, man, thank you so I much. I mean, he, he could have lived up to his name as well, isn't it? Lights out Kev. 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 <laughs> Lights out Lane. Nah, bollocks. <laughs> I don't know about that. So, Kev, you know what, my bro? Thank <laughs> you again. So, we want to start off by... Um, you know, naturally, we always like asking our guests about their childhood, growing up, how it was for you. Was it just a normal, you know, normal life as a normal child, you know? Because obviously you're, you're getting into your career in a bit. It's an absolutely, it's a roller coaster, isn't it? Yep. So we're going to start from the very beginning of you growing up. How was it? So, okay, I grew up in a place called Harefield, Middlesex. It's a village, large village, yep. surrounded by farms. But a mile, it's a mile just to get to the village. It was very high. And there's estates, houses, estates, private estates that lead off of that. A fighting man's village, lots of pubs, lots of pubs crawls. So it's a tough village to grow up in as a kid. Um, I loved it. Yep. Uh, worked as a child, always buying my own clothes. I bought my own clothes by the time I was 12 to go to school. Wow. Different uniform every day, different watch. They were snide watches. But yeah. none, nonetheless, I was 12. Of course, yeah, exactly. And I was going into the big man's school. I just found my bollocks. I was getting pubic hairs. <laughs> you know, fucking dick was like a magnet. <laughs> <laughs> education. Yeah. Fuck education. <laughs> yeah. Well, they should take that into account when kids are studying. Yeah, exactly. They got their mind on other matters. <laughs> so I got expelled from school for being too boisterous. Yeah. Um, I got a, love of, a number of brothers and sisters. One of my, my oldest brother uh, had a massive car accident when he was a kid and had to have plates in his head. I was three, he was five. Uh, he nearly died, air ambulance and all that. Um, went to school, he used to have to wear an extended crash helmet like Mr. Magoo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like the cartoon Mr. Magoo. Yeah. Um, and I remember coming out of the classroom, it was only in the infants, before we go into the juniors, and I come around the corner of a building. My brother's there with a couple of his pals of his age, they're two years older than yep. me. They were taking the uh, the verbal pee out of him, oh. and I uh, leave my brother alone, yeah. bigger than me, and I whacked one, and then it hit another one. And that was the start of my career as a fighter. But then you'd also see me at home doing ventriloquist acts and Norman Wisdom acts, and I used to love performing and laughing and stuff yeah. like that. So it wasn't in me to be violent, mm. but for the defence of another or my family, I just seemed to come alive. I didn't know that at the time as a child. So then we went through school right up to the seniors and that sort of repeated itself consistently. Um, by the time I was 14, I was fighting men of the village. Bloody hell. Not too many men, of course, because a lot of them could have picked me up and just pulled me off and shit down my neck if they wanted yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was a kid, but at the same breath, I was capable enough to be fighting men's in their 20s and things like that, at a 14-year-old boy, and, and being quite successful with that. Mm. I class him as men when they were in their 20s. Of course, yeah, of course 100%. Yeah. A 14 year old boy. Yeah. Uh, I got a flat by the time I was 15 with a friend of mine, Mark Bayless. He's dead now. I don't believe in God, but God rest yeah, your rest soul. Whoever's listening, whoever is there, they're out there. 
because we can't be the only planet in the universe, can we? Yeah. I mean, there's a whole beach of white sand and one pebble is a planet. We're that pebble, but all the rest of them are dead. Of course they're not dead. There's other, yeah. they're right. So we know there's other species out mm. there. And uh, that's another thing. But I started fighting as a kid. Um, then I met a girl. I got expelled from school. Went to a new school. Was that for fighting as well? Yeah, I hit a teacher. Oh. And what led to that? <laughs> I was caught in the sixth form hut. And he started manhandling me, roughly, yeah. rubbing me about. So I punched him, he bit me, and I punched him again. And I got expelled for it. It's a bit hell, man. He drew blood as well, he did. Wow. Yeah. He was known to be violent in school, because he was sitting in his TD class, technical drawing, and all of a sudden there'd be bang in the wall behind you. A great big lump of metal. He would dash it. Slung. <laughs> and if anybody does disbelieves me, yeah. ask wow. anybody who went to Harefield Junior in my class or sat in a class with him and ask them if he'd done that in his class. Believe me, he'd done it. Wow. He was an extremely violent teacher. And I got expelled for belting him. But Good no, on you, mate. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> yeah. Exactly, why not? So I got expelled <laughs> yeah. for that and I went to a school called Southbourne, which is now shut down closed. They've built houses on it. Mm. Met a very beautiful young lady. Uh, she was the girl in the, in the school. Uh, only thing is, her family had to be a major crime family, which I'd never heard of. Okay. So I, I didn't know anything about anybody in this country or who. I just knew who was the main geezer in the village, meant to be, and who was a, that was it. Yeah. Met her, started working licensed premises when I was 18. Yep. Uh, because they had security. And I, I had proven myself by them at a young man's age that I could take care of myself to quite a good level um and then before now i was working in clubs that weren't old enough to be in major clubs in london okay, and yeah. around like when i was 20. yeah Bloody, you were still young weren't you still young but i was driving nice cars porsche <laughs> and yeah. top of the range rs turbos <laughs> would just come out what year was this uh well, that was 88 89. 88, 89. wow okay yeah so i had a porsche when i was 18 9 11 bought out wow. of Henley's in barclays square for twenty seven thousand pound Wow. Some years ago, that's, yeah. that is worth a right few quid now. Of course, yeah, yeah. If I had to go and do the same, and mm. I paid Redis for that, I'll give a part exchange and paid Redis. Yeah, but I wasn't a thief. I was buying and selling houses, flipping them one a month. Um, I say I was a thief. I was dealing in stolen goods, whiskey, computers, working hard. But you've always had a work ethic, haven't yeah, you? Exactly. Got fantastic money working. Loved it. Businessman, isn't it? From day. I think you get more satisfaction out of working. And enjoying it, and you don't go to prison, mm. and you don't get nothing taken off of you. Put yeah. the same energy well said, man. into work, yeah. and you'll have a stress-free life and a lot happier. Of course. But when I was a young man, I was getting these options, opportunities offered to me. I thought, yeah, lovely, I'll have that, I'll have that. I never had any ag with anything I was doing apart from getting nicked by the old bill. Where well, yeah. I got paid by people and stuff, and because people like me, and you know, I was getting a good deal. Yeah. But I went down that path for a while. Um, that takes you off into areas that you don't really want to go into. Mm, of course. So you could be a nice lad, happy-go-lucky, then you're working security doors, then you're taken off into other areas. Um, I met a gentleman, he had some property stolen from him. I offered to go and take away the person who uh, had threatened the person who informed on them. Got right, yeah, Got yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That happened to be a young lady with a baby. That young lady was in threatened with a knife, yeah. and the baby was threatened with a knife. Wow. And the person said, We will cut you and we will cut your baby. Wow. The police were wow. notified. They had not enough evidence to do it, to pr proceed with it. These same people then came to the offices. The doors were locked, shaking and trying to get in. Yeah. I got a call. Can you go and put a stop to this? Yeah, no problem. Was that a friend of yours who called you? It was a managing director of that company. Okay. It was a friend. Yeah. So when we were saying that you're working in a security firm, so we're not just talking about ordinary bouncers and security at a door. We're talking about you uh, being a private security, personal security. Yeah, so yeah. personal security. I'd be do door work and security work. Of course, yeah. But yeah. then it, if people needed something sorted out yeah, or yeah. protection. You built that reputation. Yeah, yeah of yeah, course. Yeah. Like you could put a stop to things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like a legal bailiff. Legal yeah. bail. If you need someone in the area that people respect, of you course. get a right arsehole in the world that's going around bullying people. You know, if someone got a good idea and you get an old lady go, oh, it couldn't have happened to a better person. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Right. And I, I would be the person to come and dish that 
uh, punishment out on a person. Yeah. Where they might have knocked someone's front teeth out a girl. Yeah. It happened once. They said, such and such, his daughter's had her front teeth knocked out by a boyfriend. He's what? Give me the address. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Straight yeah, yeah, round yeah. opened the door, knocked his front teeth out. Go, See you man. later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't fucking hit her again. Yeah, of right? course. <laughs> so things like that. And then people see you as, it's mad to say, a bit of a Robin Hood figure. John Wayne, I, I love John Wayne. I think. Yeah, he's yeah, great. Yeah. Always fighting for the underdog. Of yeah. course. I love him in Rooster Cogburn. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. True <laughs> grit. Yeah. Oh, Brilliant, loved it, all right? Yeah. So um, then carry on then, obviously you got a, a call about someone threatening a baby and... So I went down and took the fellow away. And run him over a few times, bashed him in the head, severely bashed him about with an iron bar. And he was in hospital a week after the incident. He couldn't remember his name, just a phone number. Wow. They phoned a number and said, yeah, such and such has been missing. Um, he said, well, I got the wrong person. He was put forward by these, the locals in the area and by his work colleagues as a man that did it. It wasn't. It was his other colleagues who worked with him. And they oh. put him forward as a ruse. So he got taken away and all that done to him. I took him up to London. Wow. Took him to a canal, took him to the canal, bashed him over here to see us, gassed him and threw him in the canal. So you done two people then? It was just one person. I did. Oh, that's one person? Yeah. <laughs> and I kept running him over the legs to make sure he was telling me the truth to get, give me phone numbers. So I said, yeah. put the car on his legs again. So the car's gone up on his legs, wiped the pick that number. Whoa. We'd phone the number and then realised, yes, it is that person, it is connected to him. So we've got your details of your family, if you was to go to the police. Um, Kev, so if I could just pause you there. So from like, obviously I understand defending yourself as a young kid. What made you like go into the life of this? Like when was that first change where didn't you feel like this is not? Like when I started working the doors at 18. Okay, yeah. Working with lads that are a lot older than me. So a different life. Different life, didn't yeah. realise at the time. Too young, wasn't mature enough. Mature yeah. in many ways, where I had a flat when I was 15, but not mature enough in a way to see where I was going wrong. If I had a father, my dad would have gone, what are you doing? Yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. doing it. Oh, my dad would kill me if he finds out. Mm. I didn't have that. That's why a lot of kids who haven't got fathers end up in prison or get nicked. A lot don't, but the majority, if you look at the statistics, you will find a lot of kids in prison don't have a parent, a mm. uh, father. It's normally single parents. Oh, I can imagine that, yeah. man. It's, it's hard. In America, it's the same. Statistics. Yeah. So, but listen, you can't put that down to me. I've got options. I went to work. I worked hard. I provided for myself. Made money. Yeah. Bought my first flat when I was 18. Let's have that right. Yeah, exactly. And sold him in six months and took 16 and a half grand out of it. And that's what I was doing at 18. Yeah. So money wasn't an option. I thrived on that. But the criminal side of it, the criminality took me in areas that I wish it hadn't. Mm. Hence the kidnappings, um, <sighs> the violence. Yeah. I, w I would work on licensed premises rather than go out of a weekend with my pals because I was boxing at the time again. Yeah, I started yeah. boxing and I had four years out because of injuries, my knees, and inflammation on my knees and such. And then I went back um, and I thought, well, if I'm going to have to fight, I'll fight in the ring. Well, if I've got to fight, I'll fight on the door at the weekend and I'll get paid for it. Mm. You lot are going out and getting pissed and getting fights anyway. So you've got that much testosterone coming out your ears. <coughs> you'll fucking yeah. fight with yourself in the phone box if you had a chance. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course, yeah. And yet you're doing it and you're getting paid for it. <laughs> getting paid for it. Yeah, exactly. I'm getting paid for it in clubs where I'm getting great money. Yeah. More than an average man would get working anyway for a full week. Absolutely. Getting all the birds you ever want. Mm. Driving flash cars. So it's a bit of, um, it was a bit of that, like, wow, I'm excited. Like, yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, go. especially at that, that age, that? having yeah. all Rabbits of that. in headlights, you know <laughs> what I mean? That's yeah, what it was like for me. Mm. Um, of course, you see the, the downside of that now. But then with, with regards to, yeah, coming back to when you're trying to get the information out of the guy, when you found out it was the wrong guy. Yeah, how was that was feeling? Through, yeah. I didn't find out until years later. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I did, did, did restorative justice <laughs> yeah. with the person I kidnapped. Oh, you did it, yeah? Yeah, you've got a lovely man. We've since become friends. Lovely man. And the I'm guy so you attacked, you've actually become friends with him now? I did restorative oh, wow. justice with him, yes. That's a good story. Wow. I'm ashamed of what I've done to him. Yeah. Oh, Absolutely imagine. ashamed. And I did that to an innocent man who had not, and I changed his life and I ruined his life for many years. And I'm ashamed of that because, no, you know, I've hurt people I shouldn't have hurt. And uh, when I think about the hurt I've done for them, I feel it in myself now. And uh, I'm okay, I'm not getting upset here. But I, I, I feel I let myself down terribly for the man that I stand to be. And I apologise to Will again for that. And I will always apologise to him for the rest of my life and to anybody else that I've hurt, unfortunately, for the error of my ways. And there's a couple of people I've hurt for the error of my ways. I've yet to see one, but when I do see him, he will get a big bag of cash. 
And I said, I'm so sorry for what I did to you. And I only did something to him to find out where his best friend was to make sure I could get my hands on him. I mean, that but man. it's nice to hear that you got that remorse in you. Really nice you know? to hear yeah. that, honestly. Like, honestly. You, know, you know what the thing is? A lot of people make mistakes and they, they'll laugh it off or something. But even yeah. with you, even when you're talking to us now, we can feel right through you. Yeah. And the way you're making, you know, not, you know, we were thinking, you know, not in a rude way, but you know, sometimes you can, be, you can laugh about these things and mm. say, yeah, you know. But the fact that you feel that guilt and you feel like you yeah. did that to someone. You're not sitting there thriving off of the reputation no, of that you not. made. Yeah. And right. that's what I think, that's, you know, respect to you for that, yeah, Kevin, honestly, I, had, I really... You know, 20 I years to re think about my actions. Mm. I didn't have a telly for 20 years. I've worked, worked on my case, analysed my actions for 20 years, and that self-change came about as the hurt that I hurt myself for my own actions. And I'm, I'm pleased that I hurt, because it shows that I'm not such a bad person, mm. and I, I want to do right instead of wrong now. Of course. So... Um, so okay. when you obviously reached yeah. out, how did you get hold of him after all the years? Restorative Justice did it through a judge. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, you just mentioned that. I was that. approached by Restorative Justice um, and asked to do it, yep. and we did it. And I'll see, I'll see Will uh, quite often. I haven't yeah. seen him for about three or four months. I spoke to him the other day. I'm due to do a podcast with him. Would you boys like to do a podcast with him? I love and me? Course, man, yeah. There we go. There we go. Right? And you'll have the first Restorative Justice podcast, I think, uh, that a lot of the podcasts haven't done. That would be awesome, that yeah. Be awesome, yeah. I've reached out to James English. I've messaged him a few times. He hasn't got back to me. He must be busy. But Will's waiting. I feel like I'm messing Will about now. And he, he deserves not to be messed around. So... Well, guess, we're happy to take Will yeah. on. It'll be amazing to have you both together. Yeah. When you That'd see him awesome. as a little fella. Oh, it makes yeah. me even more ashamed. But he was stocky. Yeah. <laughs> when I took him away. Yeah, yeah. And of course, now he's slimmed up. Yeah. And, and to look at him sitting next to me now... It'd make me look even worse, and I'm glad it does. Because anybody watching this wants to realise what they would look like if they go and do what I'd done to someone smaller than him. If you're going to take someone away, make sure they're a real bad bastard or a lot bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. Then people can't really look down on your eyes. Nah, so, okay, so with, with regards to Will, was that the reason you went in for 20 years? No, I went in for no. murder. I got... So, I decided it was time to leave this country. Right. I was getting in too much ag. I security company but I had fell out of a security company in uh, Islington right. doing the door called yep. the Paradise I had a massive tear up down there with a the doorman yep. and I kept having straighteners with them they'd all jump me I'd say well I'll have a straightener with you now <laughs> I'd have a straightener with you you'd jump me again I'd say well I'll have a straightener with you then right? so that went on about three times as well as a big kick off with them and then I went back and uh, that was all right yeah. and uh, we managed to resolve the situation yep. I remember after having the big tear up with them, I thought, this isn't for me. I went out to have a nice night. I'd had a, a, a rave in my, I had a yard, a commercial yard that I yep. rented out and I kept an aircraft hanger, mm -hmm. like a Nissan up, but big enough to put a juggernaut in. Wow. And I had a rave in there, Roy DeRoach, Judge Jules and all that lot. It was yeah. on Kiss FM, it was advertised. I had four, in fact. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I went to Paradise Club afterwards where I had some doorman working there with pals of mine, but with another security firm. It kicked off in there because someone looked at me and said, give us all your drugs. I said, I ain't got no drugs on me. Yeah. I've just come, I didn't want to eat him, I'll just come for a rave. Yeah. And I said, I'll tell you what, let's just take this outside. I says, because I had respect for the doorman there. Mm. He threw a punch at me. And it went right off. Oh. And then all the doormen come and they're like, I'm standing there trading with them. I'm getting punched and coshed and yeah. everything. They tried to get me down some stairs where it was all the cellar. If they got me down there, I'd have been in trouble. Some of them like 24 stone. Wow. I'd have been proper, proper hurt. Oh, yeah. But they got me outside. Because what happened was when it broke up, yeah. I pulled out some CS gas. <clears throat> and went, right, let's equal this up now. Yeah. And my mate turned up. He's gone, Kevin, what's going on? I said, this sort of just tried to take a liberty with me now. And I'm going to eat, I'm going to even it up. You better disappear. Yeah. He walked away because he knew me. And I'll just run him with a CS gas. <laughs> I thought that's even up a bit, innit? <laughs> 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 well, yeah, but I knew what you tried to take me down the cellar, mate. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you take your eyes out. Come here. Like, lucky you had it. Lucky mm -hmm. I had it, I know. Mm -hmm. So I uh, got outside of them. I said, right, me and you. And that's what happened, what I just told you. Yeah. yeah. And then I thought, this isn't for me. Mm. I am, this isn't for me. So I went to Tenerife. Left the country, went to Tenerife. I was having aggravation nice with choice. my mother with my children. Yeah. I was messing around. I was a young man with clubs. Bollocks were all in my brain again. She didn't deserve it. I thought, right, let's go to Tenerife. I look for a new job. Sales. I love sales. I'm good at it. Um, I went out there. 
looking young, loads of birds fancy me again, or did fancy me at the time. Still do. Well, I'll do all right, <laughs> but at the time, I'll tell you another story about that in a minute. I didn't think I was that good looking. I just thought birds like me because I could fight and I dressed smart and I was yeah, funny. Yeah. Right? I didn't realise later on that a woman in the top 10 in the world at one time turned around and said I was dashing. And when she turned around and told someone I was dashing, I thought, I do not care <laughs> what anybody <laughs> says about me anymore. Because if she thinks I'm dashing, top oh, in the world, I mean, yeah, that's see it, you mean. later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then I felt a lot more confident about myself. Yeah, of course. Swear to God, that's the absolute truth. That was only seven years ago. Yeah. Oh, that's the absolute yeah, truth, exactly. lads, all right? So now I don't really care what people think of me in terms of if I'm good looking or not, because I'm happy in myself. Yeah, you mean it, lads. That's you, it, yeah. You've got, you got the stamp. So I go out to Tenerife. Yeah. I started, someone, a, a fella called Mickey Ishmael approached me, he's dead now, he's from over here, okay. he's from the Roman road, he got done for the, uh, mm. he got done for, for a few things, but he approached me and says, ease, I said, yeah, he said, can you move them, I went, yeah, I could, I don't, I'm not a drug dealer, I said, but I could easily set up something over here, so 2,000 ease a week were coming in, sometime a thousand, yeah. doves, <laughs> and they were coming up people's asses. simple as that, right? Yeah. And they would come in with all these E's and they were worth £10.50 out of season on 100. So £1,050 for 100 E's. In season, when it was really busy, yeah. £12.50. So 2,000 E's coming in a week was bringing in 25 grand. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I got rid of them in one night. Jeez. Hey, One night. Definitely was in the wrong trade before then. Bang, they just, <laughs> yeah, but it, it caused that. So they went, yeah. they went like you wouldn't believe them one night. And you've got 16,000 youngsters coming in every four days. That's without the people who are already there. Yeah. My 2,000 E's did not make a dent in the people coming. But the locals on the island that didn't like this new kid from London, Kevin Lane, yeah. serving up, put a contract on me. Oh, wow. To have me bashed up and fucking put in hospital. Someone come and told me, a fellow called Benson. Yeah. John Benson, I think his name was. He's a Londoner. And uh, he came to me and told me. And he told me who the fellow was that was doing it. So I went and found him. Didn't end well for him. <laughs> okay. Yeah. He's obviously, he's not no, dead. You, you know what? I was just going to say, you're in another country. Instead of just thinking, all right, cool, someone's out for me. Let me just get out of here. You're thinking, no, I'm going to find him. I went and bought a harpoon. Oh, wow. I thought, right, you're going to have me <laughs> shot. <Yeah>. Stabbed. <laughs> yeah. All right. I've got a harpoon. I thought, no one's going to hear this guy off in the club. Yeah. yeah. No, the little hand ones. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought, you're getting it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I was going to just shoot him in the legs with it. Go and get that taken out of your leg. All right. Damn. Anyway, I found him outside the club. Like I said, it didn't end well for him. Mm. Um, and then that settled that problem. Yeah. And I thought, fucking hell, what's wrong with these people? Yeah. No, so, and they were goodies. They were the doves at the time when things were really clean. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not advocating drugs. No, of course, I mean, not. Of course not, yeah. The Americans give American soldiers two milligrams of MDMA a day to raise their spirits, stuff like that. Mm. There is a use for drugs in this, in this world. And there's a, 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 there is not a use for some drugs in this world. Of course, yes. Yeah. So with that, Kim came out, the mother of my children. Yeah. She brought the children out for the whole summer holidays. But it's problematic. You could see it's problematic. I was kicking off fighting all the time because mm. she's really pretty. She was on the cover of Cover Girl and a real lady. Wow. Yeah. And then people would say something. Well, you, you know, and it'd go off. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think you're looking at me, a college-looking boy from the countryside, and you're insulting my missus, or you're going to come over and try and touch her up while I'm with him. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah. That ain't that Disrespectful, ain't it? Yeah. Two yeah. kids with me at the same time. Yeah. So I was in a in a, a steakhouse bar in. Uh, the Golf de Sur, and I had a villa on there at the time. Um, no, I had an apartment there at the time, and I had a villa before that or after, I can't remember now. But, yeah. uh, just rolling in peas. I was doing okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. So, they were talking about drugs in there. Yeah. My kids heard them, said, what are they talking about? Drugs, what's cocaine, mum? They're talking about drugs and that. And yeah. I was complaining to the manager. The next thing you know, I've got three fellas in front of me. One's Eric Bristow, not the darts player, but his name was Eric Bristow. Yeah. He was massive, but he was a car dealer higher cars the other one was a short geezer shortish with arms the size of my legs wow. bald head just come out of prison big Popeye chest right? mm. and then the manager of the steak bar I'm a fiery young fucker at 11 stone 7 this geezer's piped up he's going you want to calm down I said he's got fuck all to do with you mate stay out of it 
Mm. He must have looked at it and said, who's this cheeky little bastard? Yeah, he's probably yeah. thinking three on one and he's still got a mouth. Yeah, yeah, you know I'm having it, you cheeky sod. Yeah. And then he stood up, he was going, if you carry on, mate, we'll have to go outside. I went, let's go outside then, no <laughs> problem. Jumped up, he stood up, I'm going, crash, crash. He's flown back, hit the doors, they've buckled. Yeah. Shook his head and come back at me. I thought, oh, yeah. you're going to get a good idea now, mate. <laughs> so he did get a good idea and it was either him or me. Yeah, Kim got the kids up, gone straight away. She knows the score. Yeah. Right, Daddy's going to have a fight now. I know what Daddy's like. You are not seeing this. Gone. As the man was being carried out of the steakhouse, he's showing that when I get better, I'm going to come back, I'm going to kill you. Now, he was one of John Palmer's heavy goal finger. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Right. I know John well. He's now dead. Uh, but John, he had no idea what was going on now. And I thought, well, look, hold on, you've got... He's got hundreds of men working for him out here. I'm on an island on my own. I thought, oh, this is difficult. Mm. So I went back the next day to this John Bristow who's got a car hire company. I said, tell him we'll have it again, however he wants. We've got kids and the missus on here. Let's just put this to bed. I said, well, he's in hospital at the minute. He's got 127 mm. stitches in his face. I thought, my God, how's wow. that happened? I've only, <laughs> not only used my hands and nutted him a few times, yeah. but caused a lot of damage. And soon he's gone, he's got to go back to England for convalescence. And he said, when he comes back, he's going to kill you. I thought, oh, for fuck's sake. I'm on an island, yeah. but he's got an army behind him. Yeah, of course. I'm out here with my mate, Paul Blessing was there and Paul Curtis. Met him out there. I didn't know they was out there, to be fair. Yeah. I had no idea they was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, fucking hell, Paul, I didn't know you was out here. So, they, you know, I couldn't really involve them. Although Paul would have made a stand with me. Both of them would. Of course. Yeah. Uh, I said, you know what, I'm going home. I have not come out here for this. Yeah. All right. So I used an exit visa to get out the island because when I had that fight, the armed old bill come with machine guns and shot the roads off. Oh, wow. And I went through the cordon with the kids and the missus in the cab. They was looking for a single fella, not a man with two kids. Drove through the cordon wow. and stayed in different addresses. Went back to the apartment to see if they was waiting for me the, the, the next day, actually. And they were waiting in the apartment, like not at the old bill, but yeah. the obvious, they weren't there. Kim come back to England. I said, get you and the kids go home. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right? So I stayed another 17 days or something. Nothing come of it. And I thought, well, do you know what? I'm going home. What yeah. am I standing here to prove a point for? What am I proving? Yeah, yeah. So I course. went home. From that going home, I purchased a car. The car was a Ford Cosworth at the time. There was like a right souped up sports car now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that got stolen off of my drive the first night I got it. Oh, wow. Which is random. No. And there was a part taken off the engine that I took off as well as the immobilising kit on it. And they still managed to know that and get it and take it. I got that car Seems back. Seems like it's a bit of a setup, isn't it? It looks very suspicious, isn't it? Mm. I'll get that car back. But in the meantime, I'm offered the loan of a vehicle. I go down, borrow this vehicle because I'm going down to see my mother. I've just come back from Spain. Yeah. Got my kids in the car and the missus. The car's an old banger when I get there. Yeah. So... It's smoking and shit. It was a BMW, yeah. 320 BMW X Ridge. I go to a club I used to work at with my brother, and my, our pal, and my missus, and then took the car back. Took the BMW long BMW car. BMW back. Yeah, yeah. I can't drive this old shit. Yeah, so, yeah. Right? I drive around the old woman's car till I get another one. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> a murder's then happened. Robert McGill was murdered. He was shot of a pump action shot. A shotgun five times, four to the Oof. body, final shot to the head to make sure he's dead as wow. he's laying prostrate on the on the floor. Gruesome murder. Wow. Brutal. Yeah. But he was a heavy. He mm -hmm. was a face in the air. He was known for violence, known for protection rackets and all sorts of things. I don't want to talk well of him because of his family. Yeah. I have to be respectful for that. Although they probably hate my guts. But some of the family members actually support me and say Kevin never did it. So yeah. what happened was then, two fellas... Then get, I give a car back. Yeah. That car's then been seen driven out of where I give it back from a car park by another male, by a police officer who knows me and said that was not Kevin Lane driving that car. He had dark hair, but it was not Kevin Lane. The gunman at the scene had dark hair. All right. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. <sighs> Two people then get arrested for the murder. I can't mention their names because they've been complaining that I'm endangering their life for exposing them that they are super grasses, police informants, fitted me up. That's been disclosed right. to me in the public domain through agents of the criminal justice system, documents that were disclosed at court two of the Old Bailey, the high security court, on the 8th of November, and a number of other documents that cannot be argued. 
And so I'm saying the people at fault here are the police for brokering a deal with you two to be explicated at the trial, to be let go free, and then I take your position to and you've now gone on and committed another murder which you're now back in prison for. Yeah. Wow. So what happened was one of the co one of these original suspects gets yep. let out of it because he's got dark hair. I then been put in his place. My original co-defendant had a number of confidential chats. And if you go to my website, Fit It Up and Fight Him Back, uh, Instagram or TikTok, you'll see all the information I'm talking about. It cannot yeah. be denied. Mm -hmm. And then there, the co-defendant said, I want to talk to the police about the advantages of assisting them with this inquiry, whereby I will give you details of how the murder was conducted, how much was paid and how they did it. Wow. And they would also tell you about other murders that they have done. Wow. And he named me for another three murders that I know of all right, at the time. The murders that he named me for, one still very high profile in this country, unsolved, and it, it's international. And he said, I did that. I'm saying, well, if he knows so much about it, why don't you go and ask him? But with the information that he's given on these murders, made the, the, the ears of the police officers sit right up. Yeah. However... The years of one of these police officers just happened to be the handler of these two that he's just arrested. Oh, okay. And they gave evidence for another case where they got another man, Brian Donnellan, 19 years, where they kidnapped a fella, took him to a, a golf course, cut the man to pieces. They then get arrested. Two of them end up in different prisons. The third didn't get arrested. He's the main culprit. Wow. Grass in this case, yeah. informer, fit it up, however you want to put it. Wow. He was visiting yeah. one in one prison and meant to be taking those notes back to the other. Yeah. He wasn't. He was going back and giving them to Christopher Spackman. Christopher Spackman right. then used them to obviously prosecute and have an advantage in the case against Brian Donnellan. Smith got 280 hours community service for malicious wounding. Blah, 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 blah. Kidnapping, false imprisonment. He got 280 hours community service. The other one got nothing. Donnellan got 19 years. So Spackman then comes into the murder of Robert McGill. And... So just for, sorry, just for the people that don't know, Spackman's the... Corrupt police officer. Corrupt police, police officer, officer, yeah. And he's, he's went to prison for four years for stealing £160,000 out of the police fund. Wow. And the lengths he went to are unbelievable. You wouldn't, would not believe the power that one man can have to conduct complicated uh, deceits of, uh, and fraud in a police environment. Wow. Yeah. And not only that, he was doing a number of other factors. So he was central to my conviction in that he provided an alibi for one of the co-defendants. He was going around one of the co... Well, I only got one co-defendant. Yeah. Going around his house before the trial and after the trial on his own and invited <coughs> into the house. One of the, co the, the my, my co-defendant, he agreed to do a deal with the police that he would be acquitted halfway through the trial. Yeah. This is supported by Kenny Collins of the Hatton Garden Burglary. Kenny had uh, Ralph Himes who used to represent the Crays. What, my co-defendant also had the same solicitor. So when Kenny see his solicitor, he asked his solicitor about the case and he said, oh, my client's getting out at halfway. The deal's already done. He's going away for 30 years. When it comes to trial, the police get up and ask for 30 years to be imposed on me. And the judge stopped the trial halfway and acquitted my co-defendant based on the alibi that Spackman provided for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So course, yeah. my co-defendant was first seen it with the Ministry of Defence building at 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So Spackman did two runs to there from the murder scene, one by car, one by public transport. One of the routes got in there at 20 past 10, one got in there at 22. They just turned around and said it was too close a proximity to allow it to go before the jury and directed the jury to acquit him. But what the jury don't know is that he was shown off a gun in a pub, reports of it, you know, 20 odd reports of them to admit to the murder and, and members of the public saying it was them. <sighs> they gave a car to a gentleman and asked him to burn the car. That gentleman's statement was suppressed and I didn't get it till 12 years later when he admitted to being paid to dispose of the car. His charges were dropped for that because if he didn't drop the charges against him, he'd have been in the box with me and I'd have had his statements then where he's naming the other two people for approaching him to burn the car. Yeah. Wow. So all of that was suppressed. 
and the alibi. How, how yeah. was it suppressed? Like, how come none Spack of this Backroom was control of disclosure. And, and no exhibits. one knew about that? They knew about it. Other officers <coughs> knew about it. So the whole constabulary is in cahoots here for this murder. Did he have something against you? Or? He nicked me you know, years earlier. I was earlier. just going to say this to you. Yeah. I was just going to say the same thing. What was his underlining problem with you? Like, I don't understand what... What was such a vendetta against you? Or like, it was why so did you have to check the other two? Yeah, yeah but yeah. you're so passionate about doing you over. Was there something in you the past of you guys? Or Yeah. He nicked me when I was 21. I just bought a new house in a posh area. Had a front extension on it of multi-exfold stocks inside and out. So I had face work on inside the house and outside. What was he at the time? He was a detective sergeant. I had a beautiful house. Brick walls and all faults. I had Porsche standing out the front. I had ever car standing out the front. And he nicked me for something I hadn't done with people that had done it. He had to let me go. But I remember him coming to my cell door and said, I'll have you one day, Lane. So who do you think you are? You think you're the boss of this lot, didn't you? So I've jumped off the bed. Yeah. And he slammed the door. And then years later, I see his name Spackman. I thought, where do I know Spackman? Where do I know Spackman yeah. from? The light bulb come on. Yeah. I thought, that's that bastard. So he's going to have me one day. Yeah. And then, of course, it all starts to unfold. So, I had no idea at the time that the deal was done. My co defendant has been kept in prisons all around the country where he's having police visits. Out of the way, you see. Wow. I've got all the evidence of that as well. It's not speculation. Factual. I've got it all documented. Mm. And then they started building a case around me. I've got um, this Spackman. I've got letters from the CPS saying, contact the officer in charge of the case, Spackman. Contact the officer in charge of exhibit, Spackman. So when I was in the police station, my prints were taken twice. I complained about this to my solicitor. Yeah. What print do you think turned up on the bag after I'd been fingerprinted twice? When I had it done, they said, are you left or right-handed? I went left-handed. I wasn't talking to them. Yeah. Just put my left hand up. So the left-handed print was found on the bag. Three months after they'd had it in their possession, been uh, checked by all the home wow. nations, home counties, Ireland, Scotland and Wales, no match. Three months after, they take a set, second set of prints from, oh, sorry, in January, they took a set of prints. The murder happened in October. January the 10th, they took two sets of prints, should I say. And then they re-arrested me on the 26th of January. And they said, under new forensic evidence, we have found Lane's print on the bag that contains nitroglycerin. On that basis, I got remanded and then they built a case around me. I wasn't arrested to the evidence they had because the evidence they had took them elsewhere. It was a confidential chat that my co-defendant had to brought him to my door. Yes, it's like while speaking about it and trying to defend yourself, they're using that information to do you. <sighs> Asking you what hand are you left-handed, yeah. right, let's get that print, printed out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Left hand. It's, it's like a frame job, isn't it? Yeah. So you fully got framed. And for the, their own evidence supports what I'm saying in that the, it, the bag was removed from the exhibits office at the time of my arrest when I had my prints taken. Right. There's no two co-assigning signatures to it. You're meant to have a track record and there's no signature to say why, who took it out or why. So how did this slip all underneath like the judge? Well, I never had this. The judge was in on it because oh. the Ben Copper Spackman was writing out statements in the name of uh, one of the other fellas, naming me for the murder uh, and put forward. So... I mean, it's now quite that you said the judge is involved, it's literally like a lose-lose situation for you, regardlessly. But well, he's, he's going on what he's being fed. Yeah, yeah of course. So he got Spackman feeding him in the public community interest hearings. Mm. Spackman's also in control of what's called the Holmes database. And it's every message that comes in, every research, every action. Yeah. It's a massive computerised uh, uh, set of material from the first phone call about the murder to where it takes. That's another thing, sorry. The murder. Who was the actual guy that died? Robert McGill. And who was he to Spackman? No one? No one. He was just investigating his death. No, but I was thinking, like, he's been dead, he's been killed, but it's like Spackman doesn't want to get the murderers, he wants to just get him. I'll so tell you about like this now. Eternal murder. So the fellow I can't mention, my, my co-defendant, yeah. two weeks before the murder, they had taken in a young girl into their house who was 14. That happened to be McGill's niece. Oh, wow. McGill's sister-in-law or sister i'm not sure which one it was now went round to that house and slapped my co-defendant's mother that was suppressed from the evidence and if it had gone forward as well as a wealth of other evidence like the leonard bennett statements who was paid to dispose of the car yeah. um 
and other stuff, I wouldn't be sitting here now. So if we rewind a little bit here, the co-defendant was told that he would be getting out early and he blurted that out on the phone. A cop had been around my house. He told my mum, I'm getting out, but you're going nowhere. Wow. He said that, so it's tape recorded. Yep. I've got records from the prison saying, inmate's been on the phone for a while, keeps talking about getting out early. Yeah. Then he told someone, he wrote a letter, said, meet me in a smuggler's cove pub where he was reported to have been shown off a gun in there. And Bennett, who was paid to dispose of the car, also said he, he met someone in that pub who gave him the car to dispose of it, all right? Although, remember, Bennett's statements were suppressed for 12 years. Wow. S this fellow writes a letter saying, get such and such to meet me in a smuggler's cove after I'm released on Thursday. The case was stopped suddenly in the middle of the trial and the judge ordered him to be disclosed, uh, to be discharged, and he, uh, that was on the same day. So he, he knew when he was getting out. And when he was sitting in the box, because he was kept in different, he was kept in different prisons, and when he came to uh, Belmar Special Secure Unit, he was put on another spur, right. you know, two weeks before the trial, and the trial yeah. got put back a bit, and he was there for a few more weeks. Otherwise, they wouldn't have even made him the same prison as me. So they didn't want, didn't want me to say, oh, you're my co -dead. Yeah, of course. What the fuck's going on here, all right? Yeah. That is the sum total. They didn't want to keep you in the loop at all. Just keep, keep me in the dark. Keep me in the dark. Yeah. The IRA boys who escaped out of Whitemore many years ago with guns, and Andy Russell was one of them, a pal of mine, they were saying, it's not right that your co-defendant is not in this prison with you. There's mm. something not right, Kevin. And I could never work it out, but I knew something wasn't right with, by the evidence. So... And while this trial's going on, so you're, you're in jail right now? Yeah. And how long you been in there uh, at that point? Uh, nine months. Nine months. Nine months. Nine months in the Special Secure Unit. And then I made triple category, exceptional risk, put behind closed visits, permanently, couldn't touch no one, couldn't touch my solicitor. And Michael Howard, who was the Home Secretary at the time, authorised legal bugging of my legal visits. Wow. And said, but he wouldn't use it to influence, influence my trial. Come on. Yeah, exactly. The canteen culture, lads. <laughs> you know your pals, it all happens, doesn't it? And of course. So I was up against a very, very big firm and didn't stand a chance as a young man. <sighs> Got a guilty. On a 10 to 2 majority, on a second trial, I had armed jury protection 24 hours a day. The judge has armed protection. I had snipers on the roof, helicopter above the, the armed escort of taking to call. All armed police down the corridors. And the police come running into the court with guns, set the alarm off and all. Very bad. Mm. Okay, I wasn't very good at giving evidence. It was mental. You, you checked every 20 minutes. Exceptional risk all through the night. Torch. They turned the light on, flashing torches on you. Of course, they knew what they were doing. Yeah, of course. Um, I went to trial, give evidence really, 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 really badly. Uh, just stressed, I hadn't slept for two days. I was made aware of it. The judge was told that I'm not sleeping, they're keeping me awake. But they, they just ignored the judge once you get guilty, didn't they? So, they gave me evidence, got a guilt on a 10 to 2 on the second trial. On the first trial, Spackman uh, stopped my solicitor in the corridor, and I've got this written down by my solicitor's notes. It said, waylaid by Spackman. Spackman told us the to split of the jury, eight to four. Now, how does he know what goes on in the jury room? Exactly, exactly, yeah. It's sacrosanct. Shouldn't nothing be meant no, to go on there. No, nothing at all, yeah. He told my split solicitor to split the jury, and I always believed that the foreman was a copper, because they select your jury for you to select. So you can only select from uh, oh, wow. the, who the police yeah. feel were clean enough. But they'd be right wing, leaning to the right, not the left, upper to middle class. Or middle to upper class, you yeah. can say. So you're up against it all the way. And I got a ten to two majority based on circumstantial evidence. However, two, it gets it? worse. During the trial, the prosecutor, he had a tumour and he was dying. And he told the jury, through a forensic expert, prosecution forensic expert, that the grip on the bag is now consistent with me gripping a Mossberg pump action inside that bag and that the deceased was killed with a Mossberg pump action. Damning evidence. And that there was nitroglycerin or dinotrolon inside the bag. Only one particle. And that that had housed spent ammunition or cartridges uh, or gun. So the, now they're not only saying that you held the bag, you also held the gun and... Inside the bag. Yeah. In front of a jury. And the jury must have thought, we've held a gun, it's a Mossberg. That's the deceased the was killed with a Mossberg. Yep. What have you got to say about that? Mm. We've since had tests done by Trace Alexandra of City Westminster Police on behalf of Louise Shortier of The Innocent Project and Mark Daly from Panorama. 
and he can did a program called Last Chance for Justice. They conducted a test and said, absolute rubbish, should never have been used. And the, the Institute of Forensic Science in this country, who write the law in these matters, yeah. said it should never have been used. Loads of cobs, one up. Could have been a box of cornflakes in there. Weren't a gun. But they told the jury that. And if it had been a gun in there, or spent ammunition, or spent gun, it'd be thousands of particles, not one. Not one, yeah, exactly. And did you know that one in 90 people get contaminated with firearm residue a day on the train? One in 90 through contact with different people. But this was a work, uh, a, a black refuse bag, and it was found in a pipe, mm. a builder's pipe, in the boot of a car, right, the car that I was yeah. loaned. So it's damning for me. Hold on a minute, so are you saying that this was the setup from the moment you loaned that car? Moment I loaned that car. The moment I come back wow. into this country, it was a setup, yeah. and it was, it was orchestrated, because the people knew I was coming back into this country to come away from Spain, yep. and uh, I was set up. Now, <sighs> you've got the gun, and in my book, Fitted Up and Fighting Back, it's been out two years, there's no black order on that saying you can't print nothing in there, stop it, because it's all factual, I've got the documentation to prove it. Mm. That's why I'm making a film out of it by the Lennox Brothers, and it's going to be based yeah. on true facts. You want to speak about that bit yeah. in a minute. So let me just, get, I'll get you to these points, these are really yeah. important, and I'm going to cut to the chase and get through a load of stuff. Yeah. But your role, I've got to tell you, is so alarming, and it'll be in the film. With the evidence being found on the bag, got me reminded, I then go to prison, I start fighting the case, and I find out a number of factors. The prosecutor died four weeks later. At his bed, oh, sorry, Spackman. So Spackman did also went to the Ministry of Defence to see, check the records, and he gave evidence to say that the records were destroyed after six months at the Ministry of Defence. So they had no record of Vincent getting there, sorry, I can't say his name, my co-defendant getting there yeah. at 10 or 22, 10 or 20 past 10. Rubbish. And that was on the corrupt police officer's evidence, get providing him for yeah. an alibi. We know that's rubbish, don't we? Now yeah. they don't destroy files in them. Of course not, of course not. They keep that for decades, don't they? Got him and not guilty, though. Um, as well as his alibi. So the prosecutors lie to the jury, has told them stuff like that. I get a guilty, I go to prison, I start fighting the case. I get the confidential chats disclosed to me in 1999 where he's broken a deal with the police. Sorry, when you got guilty, how much did they give you? Well, I, I asked the judge how long I've got to do and he didn't tell me, which I got it in writing three years later and it said 18 years, oh. which I was really pleased with because I thought I was going to get 30. Okay, yeah, fair enough. But, so you got your decision and your time given to you after three, three years? Three years after. So is that 18 years, three years? From three years, or was that 18 years started when you were From when I started. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, I did 20, um, but they asked for 30, and I thought, the judge must think there's something wrong here. They give me the 18 years. But 18 yeah. years was quite a high sentence at the time. It was very high. Right. I was getting 12s and 15s for murder, not 18 and it's things. still is, isn't it? Yeah. Until now. Exactly. Well, it's 30 and 40s now, 20s and things. It's, oh, I did. But well, I wouldn't have got out if I didn't have some documents get sent to my solicitor from the police files. That caused a massive springboard to get me out of the, the Cat A system, through the system and out. I then went up on a pill. The prosecutor who handled my case died four weeks after for the big tumour. Okay, yeah. At his deathbed in the, um, uh, uh, not chapel, that's the, where you go to, you got cancer and things. You know when you're uh, dying? Yeah. I forget what they call it now. Um, funeral homes. Not funeral homes, it's something else. Morgue. No, not more, because they're dead when I get in the morning. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> <Where'd you> go? <laughs> oh, God. It come to me. You know when you're, yeah. you're just seeing your last days out, my bone's gone dead here. Come on. No, you're in a, like a hospital where people... Hospice. I see. A hospital. No, it begins with M. Mac 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 Millen. It's one of them places. Oh, where okay, you, yeah, one of them homing places. Where you're dying and they Mac see Millen. you for okay, they take yeah. care of you, all right? Okay. right? He was there. Lord Chief Justice Rafferty was there, and they were talking about setting up... A, uh, a, a trust to fund trainee barristers. Right. Those trainee barristers are working within the Criminal Justice Review Commission. They see my case three times. So my case is going before trainee barristers as well as barristers, possibly, looking at my case. It's never going to happen, is it? No. Never going to refer me. I also wrote to the CCRC, Criminal Cases Review Commission, to inquire if anybody within them knew police officers in my case. They wrote back and said it was inevitable that staff do or know someone who knows him, but it wouldn't cause the impartial observer 
to form the view of biased. I'll ask you what you think. Further to that, I did some investigations. You've got 14 CCRC commissioners. Yeah. One of the 14 CCRC commissioners was the chief constable of Hertfordshire Police at the time of my arrest. Okay. Okay. So you're up against it, aren't you? Yeah. More so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it gets a lot better. So I'm conducting my investigations. I wrote over 10,000 letters. I didn't have a TV. I thought, I'd watch Tell You When I Want to Go Home. Yeah. It's going to be the hardest fight in my life. Of course. And I'm going to come at you with it. And I just kept sending letter out after letter out after letter out with detailed information from A to Z in a folder. And I'll take you through what this means and that means. Videos of news bulletins on the BBC and stuff yeah. like that. And I had a big campaign. I had 250 Christmas cards every year. I had my own prison sensor to handle my own mail coming in and going out. It was like a war office, myself. And I thought, every letter yeah. I send... Get me nearer that door. Of course. Helping climb out the belly of the beast. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So very hard. Of course. And then I was made aware of an investigation that Hertfordshire Police were conducting called Operation Cactus. And I got these documents quite by chance off of another inmate who had these documents that had been sent to him by my code, stupidly. I got them documents and got them copied. In those documents, it said that the chief superintendent, yeah. Winnet, refused to be interviewed by his own colleagues from his own police force in relation to this matter. And the same police officers that were tasked with conducting this investigation were refused access to all the papers in the case by their own police force. I mean, what does that tell you? That's what I don't understand. So how did this all come about when there's so much dodginess going on throughout the whole case? It don't matter what no you get guilty. In that. No chance. No chance at Literally, all. They would have found something, even if you had some sort of evidence, they would have found something to, you know, fight against not that. use that evidence. Yeah, yeah. You know, tell you it's not valid or... It's just, something. it's it corrupt just... to the core. Yeah. So then let's fast forward a little. These documents get sent to my solicitor from the police files. They downgrade me chuck me out through the system at a great pace of knots. Mm. I predicted, you get to learn someone's modus operandi and you see how they work. I knew how the CPS worked and the police worked. I said, they're going to take retired police officers out of retirement to conduct this investigation who will go back into retirement and can't be held accountable. Mm. What happened? They had retired police officers. These police officers were obviously served their career, went into these files and again, 20 days later, after going into these files, they went back to the CPS and said there's a conflict of interest. One of them had been tutored by Spackman for two years when he started oh. his career, and one of them worked on a, a high-profile cases with him. Now, I say this. If you are tasked with a job, you know what the job is before you go into them boxes. Course, They're not going to go, open them boxes, and we're going to tell you who you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. exactly. So they went into these boxes... Then went back to the CPS and said there's a conflict of interest and went back into retirement. Flipping hell, man. Factual, that is, lads. <laughs> Factual. Yeah. So I go up on appeal now. Yeah. Two weeks before me appeal, Lord Chief Justice Hughes steps down. Lord Chief Justice Rafferty steps in and dismisses my appeal. What? Yeah. Two so weeks before. And I'd written to Lord Chief Justice Hughes, not meant to write to judges, meant to write to the clerk, but I used to write to him, yeah. send him some information. I said, how can it be that my co-defendant was supplying information on murder, charged with murder, and this evidence wasn't reintroduced into the case as evidence against him? How did he just dismiss it like that, though? After all that hard work that you've put in, built the case? Again, they probably made something up. They had no chance. So what you do, the, the, the wheels of the criminal justice system are far-reaching and they turn very slow. Mm. And once you get fobbed off and knocked back, it's another long process to get back again. Of course, so yeah. It's all just like, just keep batting them off, batting them off. Most appeals in this country take 20 years or so before they overturn them. Yeah. You might the Bridgewater 3, the Guildford 4, Birmingham, Guildford 6. I think they had four or five appeals, each one of them. Bridgewater 3, or, uh, they had, I think, five. Mm. I mean, come on. I've had like three reviews at the CCRC. A fourth that was an appeal got knocked back, so I've had four. Now I'm due to go up on the Panorama programmes because Joel Bonet from my barrister said it is a game changer on national TV. A game changer. So 
after that, did you basically end up having to serve your whole time? I served 20 years. Um, wow. I got out based on this paperwork. But still, man, you lost out. So you would have still years. been in there? They said I should remain in prison indefinitely in wow. 2010. I got that in writing. I thought, bollocks, we'll see about that. I went back and wrote another letter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, good you know you, he was so good at writing letters, that's why he's wrote a book. Very good. Yeah, now, I wrote yeah. my book. Yeah, oh, I drafted man. that. I've drafted it. And I've had pins like, say, you, you and my pals just say, well, Kevin, that don't sound right. Or that's wrong, Kevin. That fact you've got on his right. It's like, it might be a point in, in history about the gulags in Russia when, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Siberia, should I say, where they said man can adapt to anything. And I gave a date about it. And somebody said, well, that's not quite right, that terminology. So little things like that. Yeah. We've been altered through my friends. Or, yeah. Um, but I wrote that book. That's amazing, and, man. And uh, Robbie Hines taught me my legal speak. He's a, a, a paddy, very clever paddy, overturned his conviction himself. Wow. Um, and he used to help me draft my papers, taught me the legal speak, and then I picked it up from him. But he's got a brain that just sees things differently. And uh, he had a contract on his life for trying to help me. He had to wow. spend nine months in a block to run from prison to prison to prison before they could put him with me where I could protect him. You see, from what, what I've heard, it just seems like wherever you go, trouble follows. But at the same time, it's like there's people out there to get you for no apparent reason that you're aware of. Four contracts on my life because I'm trying to fight my conviction and say, well, what has gone on with these two scumbags who are working with the police? The police are all in cahoots here, whether it's the CPS, the prison service, or half your police. They're all in cahoots mm. because they've all got to known parts of the case, parts of everything yeah. that's going on. Of course, yeah. Uh, so... When I was on remand or held in uh, Watford Police Station, Spackman shot up to see the other co-defendant in Wood Hill. Yeah. The other co-defendant describes how he knew the two officers had come to see him because he was once a very, uh, got, was a witness in a very serious case where his threats against him made against his life and he received accommodation from the judge for being brave enough to stand up and give evidence. That's the, what I told you about earlier with Donnellan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he said, I shook the hands and we sat down and began discussing the case. Wow. Okay. Yeah. When I learned of this, I contacted Woodhill Prison. Yeah. And I said, have you lost your records? He said, we haven't lost our records. You need to contact the officer in charge of this case about this. And I went back again and back again and back again. And they then come back to me and said, Spackman did not visit in the realms of a police officer. He, he went in pretending to be a solicitor. And the other co-defendant said he was expecting a visit from his solicitor. And he went down to the visits room. He said, and Spackman was waiting to see me with <coughs> Kennedy. Well, I knew these officers because I was once a witness in a very serious case. But he says, they threatened to see, to nick me, place me on report, the prison did, if I didn't see the police officers. Oh, I must be frightened. I'm up on <laughs> murder. And you're going to place me on report? <laughs> You know what, can I be completely honest? After hearing even just up to there, I can understand why they want to make this into a film. I was, you know, it's so weird, you're saying all the things that I was just going to say. Yeah. Say, but the way you're speaking, Kevin, it feels like you're narrating a film. a movie. Yeah. Like, to think you actually went through all of that. Now, obviously, me, myself, I'd love to know, or, you know, pick your brain on this. When you first went into prison the first night, how was it for you thinking... Were you always adamant that you'll get out? Was it something? Because you, you know you're innocent. Yeah, you know course, I haven't yeah. done something and you think the law surely ain't going to do me for something I haven't done. Did you think, oh, you know, as days were going by, did you think that I might actually get done for this? Or I knew I was getting a guilty because the evidence was false. And I said to my mother, you need to prepare yourself. I'm getting a guilty here. They are lying. They are lying. There's something not right about this because I know they are telling lies. Course. They told lies about all sorts of things, which is in the book, and I could, I'd waste a lot of time talking to you about these points that are relevant, but I don't want to spoil other, other areas of stuff I want to talk yeah, to you yeah. about. So I knew I was getting a guilty. The first night when I was in prison, I cried. Yeah. I had tears rolling down my face. I said, Mum, what have fucking I done to you? What have I done to deserve this? Why am I here? What's going to happen now? Mm. Okay. And I was sad for my family, it was always sad for me. I was just thinking, how have I ended it? It was a very bleak cell. Very bleak in the special secure units. 
And I thought, my God, what's happened? So you've got emotions, you've just been found guilty. Of course. And you think, God, this is the rest of my life now, in here. That's what I mean. And As I thought, the years are going on, you're just thinking, is there going to be a time like, of me getting out? And you carried on fighting all that time. Yeah, I, I, I don't admit, you know, tears rolling down my face. Right? But I'll tell mm. you something now, I come out of that cell the next door, my bleeding sleeves rolled up. Yeah. And I thought, right, let's have it. Because yeah, I ain't having this. And then I got sent to the unit in Belmont, in Whitemore, knocked a geezer out in there as a super grass. And I leant over him and said, right, no one can say I've told him anything. Yeah. Made that very clear. You got a super grass in the unit and I ain't talking to him. So I hit him and he can't say he said anything about me or made something up. Mm. That caused a few waves in the unit. Yeah. And then it just went on from that. I was fighting with a mufti all the time. I was in the strip, in the box. The box is a concrete room. Right. Just concrete. No clothes, nothing like that. You're freezing, the lights go down. The sun goes down at night, you're naked. You're freezing your tits off. They're walking around the parapet wall looking at you, Martin notes on your psychologist and all that, and you're laying there like a lion or, say, a tortoise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, it's a, it's a, it might be a silly question coming from me, but I'm just intrigued to know. So, you know, because you were in there for 20 years mm. and you went quite long ago. Yeah. Did the, like, how do I say it? Because you know how you just said that there was concrete walls and you're naked and you're just cold? That's not how it is now, though, is it? So you have a box. Evolve? There's still boxes. Yeah. You can have be given a blanket or a little yeah. bib or like you yeah. know the little monkeys you see on like Sinbad. And they've got a little waistcoat. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Of course, yeah. They chuck you one of them and a little bib. A What's little the logic of that? What's the point of doing that? Well, because if you, it's clothes you can tear, and you can if they na- make you naked, you're meant to be vulnerable. But what they do, they keep you a blanket away from you. They don't give you a mattress, and you've got a little concrete, a little wooden bench. Solid wood on the floor. Yeah. So you can sleep on that, which is about that far off the floor. Bloody hell. All right. No mattress, no blanket, no bib. I had that. How long were you in there? 17 days once. And they said, you can stay in there. And they meant to sign you off daily. Hold hold on a minute. You said once. So you was in there more than once? I was in there loads of times. Fucking loads of times. And you lose, you lose track of time because you're falling asleep standing up. You can't lay down on the floor because it's cold. You get sores on your bum, sores on your back, sores on your shoulders, sores on your elbows. And, uh, and then you, you, you... Why would they take you in and out? They didn't. They left me in there. To break me. They said, break lane, get lane out of the way, the others will crumble. They didn't break. Well, I didn't fucking give in. Do you know what? They were probably hoping you just gave up on fighting your case. But, why, people... but that is not something that would help you break like that, if you know what I mean. Yeah, if anything, exactly that's going to make mean. you feel like I'm fighting harder, I ain't going back in there. Yeah, but people do break. Oh, is it, Because yeah? it's mental torture. I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't be able to deal with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly. You're right. Yeah. Even but listening to you is like, yeah, man. how are you sitting Daunting, right here with us now, laughing, joking? It's not me, it's my mate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was in that box once after a turn out. We've had a tear up with them. We said we're not going to clear up the cleaner unit anymore. We're not cleaning it, we've had enough. Next morning, we've got Mufti, riot squads at our doors. Listen to the instructions carefully, keep your hands at your side, do not move your legs at all times. What? We only said we're not doing any cleaning. We've got the riot squad in the unit. <laughs> They've gone and wrapped a fellow up who's no harm to anybody physically, but he's very dangerous with his mind. They wrapped him up. I then had a tear up with him, and I called him to the door, and I said, you know when two boxers are in the ring? And the bell goes off. They said, yeah. So the bell's just gone off. Go and get your kit on. Oh, Walked to the back yeah. of the cell, took the jumper off and my mum knitted me. I had it with them. But through that, I got a massive split on my eye, like a, a tomato, or, and it opened up. This eye closed, because when they came through the door, I'm having to tear up with them. They're at me with cosh ears. I'm punching them. I've got the shield man out of the way. Um, he's at the deck. They're pulling him out by his feet, but they're punching me mm. all the time and then hitting me. So long story short, uh, my budgie got out the cage. My budgie, my budgie, out. They had two squads, <laughs> one to come in and wear me down, another one to come in. I was to train to fight more than one person in the prison system, so I thought I can keep going for long periods of time to be strong. That was my motive, my modus, so to say. Yeah. The budgie got out. They took me to the block, put me in the in the in the box. It was about two o'clock, something like that. Eleven o'clock in the evening, they come in under torchlight, like Roman uh, legions. Oh, yeah. Uh, a little lady called Pippa Nurse, I knew her, she'd come in, she'd go, oh, Kevin, you all right? I've got to have to sew it up, but they sewed it up under the torch, because they didn't want to tell the light on to give me an equal advantage. Sewed up, no anaesthetic, no no anaesthetic wow. either, Oof. into raw flesh that's split, 
and I nearly passed out. I swear to God I nearly passed out. Sweat was running down my fucking face. She only turned around and said, Kevin, I'm ever so sorry. I've got to do it again. It's not straight. Cut the stitches out and did it again. No. I swear to God. I don't no. believe in God, but it's the same. No. And, then, uh, and I'm sitting there naked with her. She put a, they put a blanket around me then. Or a bib. I think they give me a bib. Um, and that's what my life was like in the box. And I thought, this is the hardest fight I'm ever going to have. And then I took the fight to them. No, oh, good on you. But one so thing... When, I, yeah, go on. No, no, Kev, you know, you just obviously said, um, I don't believe in God. Is that because you feel that the world betrayed you? Or do you feel like a certain part of you doesn't believe in God? Because we're God-fearing and we're God-believing Yeah, of course, people. I respect that. And I respect, no, that. I, I respect, course, I respect yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. at the end of the day, we respect everyone, everyone has their own belief, opinion yeah. on things. And People are too opinionated. It, yeah, They're getting course. on with unbleeding lives. Yeah, true. Yeah. And with you, is, 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 would you say that's only because of the way all Life's this been. has happened for you? You know, getting lied on, cheated on, no. you know, all this. It's learning about the most atro- atrocious things that human humanity can do to each other. That if there was a God, why would he put us on this planet to do much, just things that don't make sense? They say, can you have, so you can have a choice. No. How can you have a choice when a man will put a baby in a microwave and turn it on? I've been in prison with these people on the protection wings. So it is based on what you've seen and what you've... Sorry, yeah, yeah. I apologise, yeah. So yeah. I don't believe that a, a, a God would produce a human to do such terrible things to his human race that he has put on this planet. Why can't he put us all in here to get on and not harm each other? To make a happy little world. Why does it have to be so tangled if you've got the power and the creator? And then someone said to me, because there's a devil, Kevin... Yeah. I was just going to say the exact... Yeah. I was going to let you finish. Yeah. I think it, yeah. And it, was only, it was only a week or two ago someone said that to me. I said, you know what? How stupid am I that I've never given it a thought? But nonetheless, I still don't believe as a God based on things like... I mean, not, I'm going to go off the track here, but in China there's inscriptions 600 years before the Bible and they've got spaceships on them. In the pyramids they've got spaceships on the walls before the Bible. So... Why are we sticking with the Bible? There's other things that go around. And I believe that there's other species out there that have been looking at us for a lot longer than we've been. We haven't been looking at them, so they're far more superior to us. Mm. And on that basis alone, I have to question who is the God or whatever. Yeah. No, I thought we'd have a convo off camera yeah, anyway. Course, yeah. Yeah. I just thought, you, no, I just want to get yeah. in there because you said um, about God and, you know, naturally you'd like want to know why someone, why, and honestly, I'm not just saying this, but because you maybe wasn't into religion in the beginning, but when you hear your story mm. and what you've seen, you're saying all oh, this betrayal. Like, I feel like the justice system failed you. I like, failed me a business. Like, it was Fully. wrong. It was yeah. so bad. And honest to God, like the fact that you can still sit here smiling, Talk making about people laugh. Like, you're a laugh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the yeah. thing, how do you get that after everything you've been That's through? happened, do you yeah, know what exactly. I mean? Like, how many people in your position would be, not in a rude way, they'd be contemplating suicide? Broken. Like you said, they tried to break you. Yeah, well, I just I won't be beaten. I won't be beaten. I said so I will not be beaten. It's that fighter's mentality in yeah. it that you had in you. Won't and be from beaten. Young as well. From young as well. That, yeah. From young, because I just as a kid, I won't be beaten. I won't be beaten. Yeah, and he drilled uh, in you. Drilled in me, and yeah. it just in me. So I think obviously the injustice of what they've done to me. But I ain't having this. Yeah. It's hard though. I've got to tell you, very of hard. Of course, yeah. It many, be many knocks. I had a fiance that got killed in a car crash. Oh, that absolutely so broke my heart. Yeah. I went to the church with Peter Fury, the boxing trainer. I cried my eyes out sobbed like a fucking uncontrollable baby. And, was that uh, before um, you Whilst don't... I was in prison. Oh my God, yeah. sorry to hear that. And man. I knew she got killed. How mad is this? So she was a God-fearing girl, went to church. She was an odd boy at school, turned into an ugly, an ugly duckling into a swan, believe me, yeah. right? And I got her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then she got killed going to her mother's, then over to turn the stereo over, had a car accident. All right, killed instantly. Um, but she said, phone me when I get to my mum's. Phoned her mum, the phone's engaged. Phone's engaged, got through. Mm. Kevin, I've got to call you back, the police are at the door. Oh, blimey hell. Put the phone down, went to bed. Woke up, bolt up right in the middle of the night. I had a vision and a sleep, sleeping, and I had, I felt like someone had laid into me, and it was Christian's outline. Like, oh, yeah. Right? And I sat, I was all tingling, goose pimpling. <sighs> what was that, 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 
And I've never done that. I've never sat up in bed like that, okay? Yeah, yeah. Went straight out to cell in the morning, put the phone up, my mum said, Kevin, what's happening? Tell you, Christian's dead. Put the phone wow. down, went back to my cell, the vicar come to the door, I got started on no father, thank you. He said, I can do it. I said, yeah, shut the door. Shut the door, I'm in the cell, looking at four walls, just lost my fiance, beautiful girl. I was going to say, there's no point even asking, they wouldn't even allow you to go to funerals and no. stuff like that, would they? No. So I can go to the chapel and rest, to see her in a coffin, under arm desk or with a helicopter. Wow. So that obviously got cancelled. Mm. Couldn't do that. I'd never see her. I had to go through that. So my belief changed many times. Yeah. Um, but I've, I have to have some faith somewhere to think that this is going to come good because I always believed that I was going to overturn this conviction. Now I'm due to go back to the Criminal Cases Review Commission again, get my papers redrafted because my barrister has become a judge, so I've got to get a new solicitor and now a new barrister. Yep. which I'm on the on the way of doing. And I want someone who can't be brown-beaten or spoken to by the powers to be. Yep. Who want, there's got to be a lefty, an activist or something. Yep. Um, and, and I'm making waves towards that. Now, hopefully that all goes good as well, man. Well, it's an appeal, appeal point because you cannot second-guess what a jury member would have made of each evidence. So that evidence about gripping a gun in a bag, it's had 12 people tell that and 10 of them found me guilty. Mm. If the Court of Appeal turned around and say... We don't believe it, it affected any of their judgments on such crucial evidence. Yeah. They're now corrupt to the core. They are going to have to turn around and say, we believe this conviction is unsafe based on being told something that was wrong. More so, the appeal point is called Pendleton. Mm. You cannot second guess what each jury member would have made of each part of the evidence. End of. That's the appeal point. And I think it's quite reasonable to say they thought of that I'd gripped a gun in a bag. That's mm. damning for me because they came back to the, the judge and they said, can we find the defendant guilty if we don't think he was the gunman? Yeah. But I was only tasked with being the gunman. They said he is the gunman. He's got dark hair. He can only be that. Yeah. The other one was bald. Yeah. So the judge turned around and said, if the defendant was the getaway driver to an armed robbery a mile down the road, yeah. he's as guilty as the armed robbers. They come back with a 10 to 2 majority. So he's misdirected them, I yeah, believe. of course. Because they said, no, he's a gunman. Yeah. But I was charged with joint enterprise, but that's not what they was asking. So I got a guilty there, so that's something else. That's absolutely, absolutely chaotic. Exactly. Honestly, sitting here, I'm like, bloody hell. Yeah, exactly. And I'm, I'm sure, like, you know, naturally, the emotions you must have had in there, you must sometimes, do you still have nightmares about stuff? Do you still sometimes I have no there? nightmares. No nightmares. I've just filled a TV series in Shrewsbury Prison. The production team put me up in a nice hotel on, the, on another night when I should have gone home to invite me out with a production team. And I said, don't worry about that. I said, no, I'll go back and sleep in there. And then you are not going back in there to sleep in a disused prison, Kevin, in a bunk, in a prison bed. I said, I've been in it for the last 10 days. It makes no difference to me. Mm -hmm. I'll get in there, get me head down. I'll get up in the morning and go out. You're going to a hotel. <laughs> wow. And I thought, oh, no problem, thank you very much. But I didn't mean it like that. I thought, of course, I'm yeah. quite easy. I've slept on the floor for, I think, six months, and I've got a barn. I was on the floor with, like, a harem, lad, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'd have my quilts all on the floor, yeah. and all my blankets and my pillars. Happy as anything. Yeah. Didn't need a bed. So, but then I went and got a bed eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because... You need a bit. Well, I need to got a bed in it. I'm not going into the wild. I've got a bed. But, uh, 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 got a bed. Yeah, I want to speak about something. Obviously, you haven't touched up about this, but you've obviously got um, two sons, isn't it? I've got uh, I've got four boys. Four boys and a girl. Wow. Two, two sons were before you went. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to tell me. Yeah. Yeah. So, Kev, obviously, you know, we haven't really touched up about your family life, having children, and I want to find out, you know you being a role model to your kids like your father is, do you sometimes feel like, I wish that, you know, it's kind of a form of regret. Do you regret, you know, the way your kids have probably seen you, seen your life? Do you wish that you could have changed things? Look where I am now, where my life's taken me, and it could take me to a, an area where I could buy an island and retire, mm. and leave an island for people who want to live on an island, another part of the world, and real, lead a real happy life. And I can do some good with things that happen now. So I have to look back and say, I do regret some of the things that have happened that my children have been witness to. But hopefully now going forward, 
then memories will be distant. However, my eldest son, Aaron, has great difficulty in... Uh, he cannot talk about my crime. Mm. He cannot talk to people about it. He doesn't like being around people that he absolutely loves and adores because they're my pals who remind him of me going to prison. I have very little contact with my eldest boy so much because he's very busy in work, loves me. Yeah. He comes and kisses Dad kisses me straight on the lips nice. every time. A big cuddles, loves me like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. But he suffers badly because of what happened to him and, and my other son. My youngest, second eldest, he's pretty, he's cool in terms of he doesn't affect him as much, but he doesn't talk about it as much, but he can come and see all my pals and he comes to my events. So my children have suffered. I'm hoping now as a result that the, the good I do in the world now for keeping people out of prison, men's mental health and so much more, of course. that the good outweighs the bad. 100%. 100%. And I'll continue on this path. But my children have suffered terribly. My youngest, who's five and a half, I didn't see him on a recall for all those years. And the mother is very, very bad. She's now in contempt of court and have made it penal, mm. which means criminal. Yeah. Uh, not seeing my son and the court's finding against me because I'm a convicted contract killer trying to fight your case and prove you're telling the truth when you've got a little five foot four woman smashing her overhead with paintings and punching you yeah. and telling the judge she hits me. You've got it all wrong, Your Honour. Yeah, of course he does, Mr Lane. <laughs> then comes out, it's true. And I've got a message, yeah, I did hit you, I did do this and sent them to the judge and they look at me for years, been telling the bloody truth exactly. all along. So that's very difficult. Mm. And it does, things do work against you. I had a hundred thousand pound a month contract with uh, an insurance company. I had other contracts i lost that as soon as panorama came on and mm. uh, they just said you can't be going into homes so things like that do suffer people do look at you differently but you see how you just said that hundred thousand uh pounds contract mm. it's a month it's, yeah. but they also turn around and said i kill people for 100 grand. this is what i was just about to say i was saying you see how the media will manipulate it and they'll say he's a hundred thousand he charges a hundred thousand pound as a hitman to go and do so you, they've actually labeled you a contract killer is that what you're labeled yeah, as? contract killer Cause I've read it online somewhere as well. Though. Number Contract one in the country. They had a te yeah, list of ten. Shawshank, isn't it, or something like Mr. that? Mr. Shawshank. Yeah. And then he had me number one on the thing as the number one contract killer in the country. Mm. And I'm thinking, hold on a minute. Like, they can trial by media. They can say what they want about you and do what they want. Yep. That's the hardest part. Of course. And the hardest part is turning that back and saying, hold on a yeah, minute. Yeah, of course. Let's get this right. Kev, something, sorry. I just thought about something. You know, for an example, when the guy got killed... And they put you in, what was the guy's name? McGill. 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 When McGill was killed, didn't he ever ask you where you were at the time? Yeah, I was at home with the kids. But Spackman was going around my house, threatening the mother of my children, knocking on the door saying, oh I'm going to nick you, yeah. and we're going to place you in my mind, you're going to be in the dock next to him. Wow. All right? Yeah. And then turning up at her work, turning up at the gym. All right? Bloody Raided God. the house twice with armed police. Yeah. In front of the kids? Yeah. Everything, oh, while they're in bed and all that, carry on. Our police in the yeah. house. Do you know what my next question is? And it kind of goes hand in hand with what you just said. You was inside for 20 years. When you come out, it must have been very different for you, especially with technology, the world. Yeah. Because yeah. with what you're saying, I don't think stuff like that could happen in this day and age. Unfortunately, there is corruption. Of course there is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably more um, so now, isn't there? Yeah. They do need massive reform. They need to do away with non-disclosure. No, but public I'm saying community that interest. Go into your yeah, home. You've got the Ringo doorbell, then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. must come out for iPhone. That What's Ringo? that? <laughs> iPhone, Bluetooth, sat nav, memorable information, passwords, different coloured bins, Johnny Foreigners everywhere. Who don't yeah. even speak English. Yeah. You can't hear. I didn't understand. Russian, Lithuanian, Indian, Polish. Pakistani. Yeah. No, no, no. Because uh, Simone's half Iranian, half Indian. My, my, my former partner. Yeah. Um, I, got, I went to Southall College. There's, there's two white kids in a school of 30, in a class of 32. Okay, I added yeah. the reverse side. Oh, yeah. okay, but yeah. didn't give a monkey. So I started going out of a 16 year old girl in there, and she, I could taste curry in her paws. <laughs> I thought, if I'd have had a daddy, would have told me to expect that. <laughs> but it was a shock for me, <laughs> that. So I thought, I never expected what, what, that. Sorry, just like, <laughs> what, what, what curry was it? <laughs> I can't remember, but I knew it was, I knew it was curry. <laughs> <laughs> but you can understand that because yeah. she's eating curry every oh, day yeah. and a whitey would under, would think bloody hell yeah. <laughs> spicy one <laughs> the old white boy over there so 
yeah. went to there, I went to the universe, we've gone off track. Yeah, yeah. Nice, sorry. Um, I did see a lot of changes, yeah. um, which was, I didn't think it was good for like the European gates were opened by David Cameron and then we had an influx of drugs, guns, prostitution, yeah. trafficking. That came through the European borders being opened and young kids having guns in the country now that never would have had the guns before because they can buy a gun in Romania for 50 quid in a gun shop and you can get a boot full of them, yeah. drive through the borders and get a king's ransom for them over here wow. and go back home and be rich and buy a house. That's why we've got so many guns over here. It's disgusting. Yeah. That's why there's so many deaths in the country of young kids running around with guns and kids doing tickets on the street and shit like that. Mm. And I see them come into the prison and they bring the new gang culture, shooting kids on the street, Operation Trident and that. They come in prison, they're not criminals. They start robbing people for their drugs, robbing people for their money, taking off from what they can get instead of welcoming them. Mm. Change. See a big evolve change. So, um, yeah, my opinion it's so on true. that. It's yeah, so true. Course. Is that one of the biggest changes you saw at yeah. the time that you were away? Obviously- Kids coming in, how they fought, how they treated each other, no respect for their fellow interns, sticking spoons up people's backside to get their puff out. Mm. My God. Wow. Yes, tipping oil over someone else because you've fallen out of him because he's moved your bleeding fridge bag. Boiling not fat straight over the head. Ears coming off. Wow. Fucking going head like crackling in intensive care nearly dying I've seen all sorts me all sorts but the napalm came in through the Al Qaeda they started doing that the English boys used to do sugar and bloody water, water. Yeah. Yeah. then they made the napalm which is boiled ghee and when they didn't have ghee they went plastic bottles and batteries boiling up and you got that wow. so then there was a divide you've seen all of that happen yeah 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 so then there was a massive divide with terrorism but the IOA came in, but there was no problem with them and the normal lads in prison. But the terrorism came in with, unfortunately, misfits who aren't welcomed at school. They come into prison. Hello, brother. Hello, brother. Mm. Then they're welcomed. Then they're crashing, hitting the mat. Then they're being made to feel like they're martyrs. Get your orders. Do your, go and do the stabbings. You'd have 10 or fucking six or seven blokes getting their orders, going off and committing acts of stabbing to bits or oils in the prison system. We're getting manipulated, isn't it? Not, yeah, manipulated. But also I'm saying, can't you see that it's not going to work because they don't, some of the, the lads that come in respect their religion very, very strictly. Of course, yeah. of course. They don't like porn. They don't like drugs. Yeah. They'd come down the gym. There's a solicitor that got oiled up because it, uh, some lads went down to the gym and it wasn't their session because there was... Uh, Muslims and they didn't want music in the gym but it wasn't their session so they turned the music off a solicitor said this is our session you've got your session later mm. and he, I think he's uh, Asian or he's not Muslim but he's Asian yeah I've been right or, or something like that yeah anyway he got oil over the head wow for that and I'm saying look if that's the case you've got to have internment which means the IRA had internment when they took off the streets and put you on remand if you put lads on remand in one place where they're not going to be arguing with other lads because they're playing music or they're cooking bacon in the kitchen, as a result of them cooking bacon in the kitchen, they're going to get a pot around the head. That's happened so many times. They shouldn't have to be fighting over their religious beliefs. Of course, yeah. You should look, except they've got different beliefs and let them live on their own. Whether if you want to live over, if you boys want to live over in one house with me, and my pal over there who's Jamaican wants to live over in the house with me and we'll live together because we all agree we want to listen to music in the gym he can cook bacon in the gym it's not going to affect me because I will clean the stove down or he will clean the stove down we live as a family yeah of course all them ones that don't want to live as a family bugger off because you're not welcome here because you're upsetting the happy uh, between us all as a family because we were a group years ago yeah. and we had massive respect for each other and we looked after each other. We were not attacking each other with napalm. I only see one person get watered with sugar in nine years. Wow. And then it was happening monthly. With the young kids coming in for Operation Trident, signing up to Islam, because they've got a problem with you, because I've killed your brother. Wow. So the next thing you know, I will sign up to Islam. Yeah. You're not meant to hurt me. They're going down to a mosque on a Friday, stabbing the life out of each other in a house of prayer every week. And three weeks on the trot, there was more of that going on in the house, in the mosque. So you'd say people were reverting to Islam and For stuff like that just to be safe. Squash their debts. 
and then be part of the bigger gang to start robbing people and taking stuff off them. Not everybody. Not everybody, of course. Of course, yeah, of course. But the kids coming off the street, that's their mentality. Yeah. See? And then they're into the bigger gang. And that's not what Islam endorses at all. Of course not. Because it's peace. Of course. Do you know the Jewish system comes from Islam? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. I know how peaceful it is. I love yeah. Islam. And I'm proud to say it. Mm. We've got a beautiful nature and beautiful people. Yeah. The ones that don't. And the same with bloody English, Scottish. Well, I'm Scottish. I don't say bloody Scottish, but yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah, I don't no, really know yeah, what yeah, yeah. Any bugger from any part of this world, if you're bad, you're bad. That's it. If you're good, you're good. Exactly 100%. that. And that's it. Yeah. 100%. And there's no difference with colour, race or nothing. Exactly. What's in the arts important? And these kids on the street want to realise that. And they get on a lot better. Do you know what the best neighbours in the world are Indians? Mm -hmm. Cook your nice curry and watch your own. <laughs> <laughs> and they're very hospitable. Yeah. Very welcoming. Yes? Yeah, yeah, of course. Come on, <laughs> lads, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Kev, you know what? On that point, because we're laughing, oh, mate, yeah. it's been a really brilliant, brilliant chat with you, and oh, I've mate. loved every minute of it. Probably one of my best podcasts. 100%. I've, I've actually thoroughly enjoyed it. So there you have it, guys. That was Kev. Please do make sure you like, comment, Share and subscribe. And hit the bell notification so you don't miss none of our But uploads. before we leave, Kev, I need you to just look in that camera and just leave a message to someone, you know, a message to people that, you know, not to lose hope, not to give up, because it's very easy to do that in 100%. this day and age, especially. But the way you've come across and, you know, you're a lovely chat, honestly, oh, thank away from you. camera as well. Hey, I mean, get, you go, my heart. And you're not a fighter, man. Yeah? Yeah. I'm very humble. I get, I get, I'm not very good with praise, but thank you. No, man. Nah, that's when you need to leave a message yeah. for people yeah. who are going through a lot and they need to be strong. And maybe watching this, they might be, you know what, if if Kev could go through all of that and still sit here smiling, making us positive. laugh and be yeah. positive, you know, they might take a lot from it. So, it does cost nothing to smile, nothing at all. When you smile and you'll see a reaction change in your body, smile. <laughs> How do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Now give that some thought. It costs nothing to smile and makes you feel good. It's a natural reaction in your body. So people don't smile enough. But also, you mustn't lose hope on the horizon. And we've all got different degrees of enjoyments in life, but this is one life, live it. It's not a dress rehearsal. So whether I'm driving along in a Ferrari or you are sitting in a prison cell, I sat in a prison cell and I turned the negative into positive and thought, I love the tranquility here for a minute. Just sitting here, that door shut. I'm in a safe haven in this box but it's still, and I can have some meditation. So as mad as that seems, I found a positive out of negative. Brilliant. <sighs> if it's a nice shiny day, find the goodness in that day. And don't worry about what you haven't got, but what you've got now. And smile, enjoy it, be with the people you love or just nice people. And try to do a good deed, whether it's a smile or help someone out every day. And see the reward that comes back to you from that and have more time to listen to people and don't judge people so much and try to look what's in the heart. And I, w I wish you all the best. Stop judging people by colour. Please judge them by the goodness in their heart because I've got some beautiful people around me and I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for their support. And I wish you all the best in the world and hopefully my podcast has done some good and give you some strength. And thank you for watching me. That's At that amazing, point, that was, that was amazing. It's just an amazing guy, mate. So Brilliant. there you go, guys. Make sure you like, comment, share, subscribe. Peace, Peace. out. Peace out. Yeah. Love. <laughs>